into the data, I just wanted to take you back in history um, a little bit and remind you what a special time the 1980s were. <laughs> and in particular, 1988 was a really great year, particularly with regards to pop culture and science and technology. So if you're a Spartan like me, Michigan State won the Rose Bowl. Uh, the Jamaican bobsled team debuted at the 1988 Winter Olympics. I don't know if this next one's a blessing or a curse, but the first commercial email system went on the market and online. <laughs> and then finally, the one that you guys probably care about, Rich Slinsky started his long-term evolution experiment. Um, and this experiment, running since 1988, is one of the most long-running evolution experiments, one of the most productive, and I would argue one of the most important evolution experiments of all time. What you're probably less familiar with is another long-term experiment that was started in the same year, 65 miles down the road from Michigan State's main campus. Um, and this was the Kellogg Biological Station long-term ecological research site. Now there are 28 LTR sites all across the United States. And these LTR sites are, are really great resources and have really advanced community ecology and ecosystem ecology. What the early originators of these sites didn't necessarily appreciate and what I certainly didn't appreciate back in 1988 when I was a fifth grader who hated biology but apparently liked carrying around dead raccoons <laughs> was that these are also really great experiments for studying evolution out in the wild, out in nature. And the reason that these LTR sites are really great resources for studying evolution is because the same treatments have been applied to these plots repeatedly for decades. And so for generations and generations and thousands of generations in some cases. And so we're using one of these LTR sites, the KBS LTR site, um, to ask questions about evolution. And in particular, we're using a fertilization experiment that Kate Gross started back in 1988. The nice thing about these experiments is that they're replicated. So we have six replicate plots, you can think of them as populations, that have been fertilized with ammonium nitrate for going on 30 years now. Um, and then we have six control plots, which are nearby but have not received any nitrogen fertilizer. And so we're using this experiment to ask questions about the legume rhizobium mutualism. And in particular, about how nitrogen addition might affect both the ecology and also the evolution of this mutualism. And nitrogen is really... I'm having trouble with this plug. You want to, won't you? There we go. Okay. And nitrogen is really important to this mutualism because this mutualism is a classic example of resource mutualism and it's based on the exchange of two resources. Nitrogen, which is fixed by rhizobia, so soil dwelling bacteria, which are housed on these nodules in the plant roots and it are provided to the legume host. And in exchange, the legume hosts provide the rhizobia with carbon. Um, and we expect this mutualism to be really susceptible to nitrogen availability in the soil because of the because it's one of the key traded resources. And both heuristic theories, explicitly quantitative theories, predict that nitrogen in the soil environment should affect the evolution of both the legume host plant and also the rhizobium bacteria. Um, so in terms of the legume, we expect to see selection for reduced plant dependence on rhizobia in high nitrogen environments. And those theories also predict the evolution of decreased nitrogen fixation or evolution of reduced cooperation in the rhizobium partners. So to test this prediction, and particularly the one about the rhizobia, we've gone on into these long-term nitrogen addition experiments at KPS and isolated rhizobia from these 12 different um, plots, these different replicate plots. And we can isolate our rhizobium strains, we can inoculate them onto plants in the greenhouse, and what you can see is that when we inoculate plants with strains isolated from the control plots, shown here in blue, so relatively low nitrogen environments, they produce a fair amount of biomass, and when we inoculate them with rhizobium strains isolated from the nitrogen addition plots, they produce much less biomass. In other words, these rhizobia are not nearly as mutualistic as the rhizobia from the control plots. And this is true for the three species of cl uh, clover that we looked at, Trifolium hybridum, pretens, and repens. So pretty consistent results across these three leggings that are found in, in these nitrogen addition plots. And we're pretty confident that these are microevolutionary changes in the rhizobia, in part because um, this is a cladogram based on the ITS gene. And what you can see is nitrogen strain shown here in red, control strain shown here in blue, and they're interspersed across the phylogeny. So it's not just different clades that are being selected out in these different environments. It's, it's, these 
are all mixed up across the phylogeny. And all of these strains nest within the rhizobium, legumen, and serum species complex. So now that we know that nitrogen addition has caused the rhizobium to, to, be, um, to evolve to be less beneficial, we're taking this work in three main directions. So my collaborator at the University of Illinois, <coughs> Katie Heath, is really focusing on the genetic mechanisms. What are the genetic mechanisms underlying this evolutionary response? Um, I'll talk a little bit about the evolutionary mechanisms. Is this adaptation? In other words, is less cooperation adaptive for the rhizobia in high nitrogen environments? And then the work in my lab mostly focuses on the ecological consequences. How does the evolution of reduced cooperation influence how the clover plants interact with herbivores, pollinators, other plant competitors, or even potentially the nitrogen cycle? So for this first part, for the genetic mechanisms, there's two main things that could be causing the evolution of reduced cooperation. In rhizobia, the bacteria, a fair number of the genes, particularly those genes uh, controlling the interaction with the legume host, are housed on these plasmids, not on the main chromosome. So one potential mechanism is lateral gene transfer, that these bacteria are exchanging these plasmids, and that's what's causing the evolution of reduced cooperation. So we can do this by making a, phy a phylogeny based on genes on the main chromosome, a phylogeny based on genes on the plasmid, and asking are they congruent. If they're congruent, that means that not much lateral gene transfer is happening. If they aren't congruent, that means that lateral gene transfer is rampant, and it could explain some of the reduced cooperation, particularly if we look at the plasmid cladogram and we see strains from nitrogen addition plots clustering with other strains from nitrogen addition plots. So we've done this, Ben Gordon, a grad student in Katie's lab at the University of Illinois did this. He sequenced gene on the symbiosis plasmid chromosomal gene, and what you can tell is that it looks like spaghetti. This means that the phylogenies are not congruent, there's a lot of lateral gene transfer happening. This lateral gene transfer does explain some of the reduced cooperation that we observe. So these dots here um, are indicative of the quality of the rhizobia. So white dots indicate high quality rhizobia, black dots indicate low quality rhizobia, and there is some phylogenetic signal there. So um, this clade in particular has many more of the less cooperative strains. This clade right up here has more of the cooperative strains. So lateral gene transfer is happening and explains some of what we see. The other possibility is that there's point mutations at specific genes. And so what Katie's other student, Christy Klinger, has done is she sequenced all of our strains. And then what she did was she did an FST outlier analysis to identify which regions of the genome showed significant structure between the nitrogen addition plots and the control plots. And she found this particular region, which happens to be on the PSIM plasma, so a region that we know contains a lot of genes uh, controlling this symbiosis. So it looks like point mutations also contributing to the evolution of reduced cooperation. <coughs> So the next thing we want to know is, is it adaptive for, for rhizobia to be less mutualistic in these high nitrogen environments? So there's, there's kind of two alternative hypotheses here. One is that nitrogen addition strains, or sorry, less cooperative strains are actually favored in high nitrogen environments. They they're provide some selective advantage to the rhizobia. The other hypothesis is that it's just relaxed selection. In other words, adding nitrogen reduces the mechanisms or the strength of the mechanisms that favor more cooperative strains in low nitrogen environments. And there's a couple ways we can try and um, differentiate between these two hypotheses. One thing that we've done is we've looked at nucleotide diversity across the genome. And what we find is that at, those, at that region that, that we identified in the FST outlier analysis, there's reduced nucleotide diversity in the N in the rhizobia populations isolated from the nitrogen addition treatments, suggesting that there's strong purifying selection, suggesting that there's selection for less mutualistic rhizobia. The other thing that we've done is kind of a classic local adaptation experiment. We've taken strains of rhizobia isolated from the control plot, strains isolated from the nitrogen addition plots, and then inoculated them on plants that we either didn't fertilize, grew in really low nitrogen environments, fertilized a little bit, or fertilized a lot. And then we look at nodule number, which here is our, our really crude and preliminary member uh, representation of rhizobium fitness. Um, but this is also consistent with the idea that those strains are adapted to high nitrogen conditions. So in high nitrogen conditions,
has been strenuous isolated from the nitrogen addition treatment class, long-term treatment class, outperform the strains isolated from the control class. So both of these pieces of evidence are suggesting that there's something about high nitrogen environments that actually favors less cooperative mutualists. So the final thing that we're working on is how this rhizobium evolution influences higher trophic levels, plant communities, and ultimately nitrogen availability in the system. Um, and a lot of this work is preliminary. So this uh, is a schematic drawn by an RU student in my lab last summer. She's actually coming back to the lab this summer to finish this, um, this experiment. But what we did was we inoculated plants with rhizobia, either good rhizobia from the control plots, bad rhizobia from the nitrogen addition plots, or no rhizobia. Looked at how the rhizobia treatments affected floral traits, like inflorescence number, color, or inflorescence size, and then in turn how that affects honeybee visitation. And so she does find effects of rhizobia on these floral traits. These floral traits do affect pollinator visitation, and she's, she's working on that more this summer. The other thing that she did was she did uh, herbivore preference arrays. So she'd take a leaf from a plant that was inoculated with good rhizobia, a plant that was inoculated with um, the, the bad rhizobia from the nitrogen addition plots, or a control leaf, and then just look at how much damage these different leaves received. And what she found was that the amount of slug damage a leaf received was directly correlated with rhizobium quality measured in a separate independent experiment. So a plant inoculated with high quality rhizobia gets much more herbivore damage than plants inoculated with lower quality rhizobia. Um, we've also done mesoplasm experiments, so we this was the most beautiful and sweetest smelling experiment I've ever done. We created these big mesocosms that, where we simulated old field communities. So we planted in the Trifolium host plants, but then also a lot of the other dominant species at the KDS LTR site. We inoculated each mesocosm with a cocktail of rhizobium strains isolated from nitrogen addition plots, isolated from control plots, or no rhizobia, and then looked at what happened to plant community composition, soil nitrogen availability, and things like that. And what we found is that uh, mesocosms inoculated with strains isolated from those nitrogen addition plots, so in other words, the poor quality rhizobia, the soil at the end of the experiment um, had reduced levels of ammonium, reduced levels of nitrate, compared to mesocosms inoculated with control strains, so this really high quality rhizobia and mutualism. So it looks like this, these evolutionary changes in the mutualism are affecting nitrogen availability. And now we're working with Wendy Yang, who's an ecosystem ecologist at the University of Illinois, to actually trace the nitrogen through the system. Um, and this is some preliminary da data she just sent me um, the other day. But if you look at the percent nitrogen in our, in our trifolium host plants, what we see is consistent with what we might expect. Those inoculated with strains from the control plots, the high quality rhizobia, have more nitrogen in their tissues. Those inoculated with the, the bad rhizobia from nitrogen addition plots have less nitrogen. And those uninoculated with control, um, sorry, uninoculated with rhizobia are very similar to those that were inoculated with the lower quality rhizobia. And we're actually also doing isotope analysis on competing plants uh, to see if this nitrogen is, is transferred to those as well. So with that, I'll thank my collaborators, Katie Heath, she's done all the genetic work, Wendy Yang, um, she's working on the isotope analysis Dylan Weiss is a former postdoc who worked on this project. And then Mark Hammond is my research tech extraordinaire, and this is his worst nightmare. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>